huge banks are constantly getting fined hundreds of millions of dollars for you know supporting money money laundering or nefarious activities or you you name it um so the idea that having somehow an untraceable digital cash uh, is going to be the cause of all this activity to me that's just ridiculous do you love coffee and monero as much as we do consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup pay with monero for premium fresh beans and if you like what you taste send a digital cash tip directly to the guatemalan farmers that made it possible Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys. Cake Wallet is trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever by typing in MoneroTalk.crypto in your Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Vanessa Harris, Chief Product Officer at Permission IO, who is becoming more and more vocal about her growing interest in Monero and who has a knack for expressing why society needs true digital cash. The two discuss Vanessa's long-standing interest in digital cash, privacy, government regulations, what it means to own your own money and data, plus much more. Monero Talk starts now. Okay, Vanessa, how's it going? I'm doing good. It's great to be on the show. So have you ever heard of Monero Talk? Is this, is this your first run-in with Monero Talk? I know I, I hit you up on Twitter. Did you know about us beforehand? Just curious. Yeah, so I hadn't actually heard of Monero Talk before. Obviously, I you know heard of Monero, but uh, your show is new to me, and I'm you know excited to be here and, and learn and to to get to uh, know you and and the folks watching. Cool. Yeah, as you as you can, I'm sure you can guess, most of the conversation is around Monero. Uh, and <laughs> that was a tough one. <laughs> that, that's our passion around here. But I reached out to you because I saw you on Twitter. I've been following you quite a bit. Uh, you have you have some good takes. I saw you were talking about privacy coins a few weeks ago, and uh, I guess you have a ton of followers because you get, get you get you get a really good conversation going when you tweet. And I think you were talking about Zcash at one point, and then a bunch of Monero people started talking to you about Monero. And then recently, I saw you yourself just mentioning Monero. How how you're finding some interest in it. So I wanted to bring you on. Uh, you have an interesting background. So maybe we could start with that. You want to quickly uh, give your background, tell people what you're all about? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, I'll start with my professional career background, and then I'll talk a little bit about, you know, crypto and how I stumbled across that. Uh, you know, I've been in technology now for more than 20 years. Um, I spent nine years at Microsoft as a, a product manager and product leader. Uh, another 11 years at Google, again, as a product manager and leader, um, doing things like founding and launching Google domains. Um, right now, I'm the chief product officer for Permission. And Permission is a, a Web3 advertising company. And really what we're trying to do uh, in the, the role that I'm in is to bring that sense of data ownership and share in value distribution to the ad ecosystem. You know, one which is right now, you know, not a, not a place where users have a fair shake. Uh, there's a lot of uh, regulation tailwinds in terms of uh, people demanding privacy, essentially, you know, which plays very nicely into Monero, but not a lot of uh, tools, especially not a lot of Web3 tools to enable this. So that's a place that Permission is, is really leading and, and pushing the forefront of uh, what we're able to do from the advertising space. But that's a long journey, uh, you know, and so we're just getting started along that journey. Awesome. Uh, awesome. So has this always kind of been an interest of yours? Um, you know, this idea of protecting users' privacy, protecting their data. Um, is that something that you've been interested in for a long time throughout your career? Or? Yeah. So what was interesting is my uh, final year uh, college project that I did was actually on anonymous digital cash. This was, you know, many years ago, back before Satoshi and the blockchain and all of that, where innovations like eCash uh, were things that were being talked about. And the state of the art being researched was cryptographic protocols and technologies to be able to do things like detect double spending. And, you know, how do you wrap some of the, the cash in a way that it can be, you know, uh, spent once and then not double spent? And what's the whole system around that? 
uh, it was fascinating. I was reading through some of my old notes and one of the challenges that folks had at the time was, well, what happens if you load your, your digital cash onto your smart card and then you lose your smart card? And how do we enforce kind of the backup in two places? So you can see like the state of the art technology just hadn't uh, evolved to the point where it could be, you know, decentralized. Um, a, a lot of the challenges came from these centralized authorities. Um, so that was where I really got started. I spent a lot of time uh, diving deep into opinions by folks like Bruce Schneier, uh, who at the time, I'm not sure, you know, I haven't followed him recently, was very much at the forefront of some of the cryptography and uh, some of the work being done on AES, which is the Advanced Encryptment, Encryption Standard. Um, and yeah, just getting my feet wet more in the technological underpinnings. Um, so that's where I got started and you kind of sort of interested in security and privacy. What year was that? Uh, I'll be giving away my age, but let's just say the early 2000s. <laughs> okay. Very cool. So, and you, that was a college paper you said that was a, uh, that was college research or that was post? Yeah, it was college. So that what we had to do as part of our final year was to pick a topic and kind of go deep. It wasn't uh, original research, but it was more understanding the landscape that was out there and uh, doing really creating our own almost college course from it and, and, and writing a fairly meaty project that covered the, the space in a way that could be explained to other people and uh, why it was interesting. So I got to dive into something I found interesting that wasn't on the curriculum. Very cool. So even at that time, what, what, what was your interest there? Like, why did you want to study digital cash or think about digital cash? Is it? What, what... Yeah, I just felt like there was, there was a, uh, as we were moving into the uh, internet world, and this was still very, very early in, in all of that transition, um, that there was a lot of conversation uh, around well, how do you keep things private? You know, PGP was a big thing and they were trying to look at how you do private messaging um, and, and how you can really take what is a, a public communication channel and start to enable some of the privacy that we enjoy offline in a sense. Um, and it occurred to me that, you know, transactions within the digital world were another place where we didn't have a good model or mirror for cash. Uh, you know, credit cards, come with a centralized authority that can track you, that uh, knows everything you're doing. And it was interesting to me of like, okay, we're looking to build private messaging, but how can we build private transactions in a way that are truly private to all parties involved? And it seemed like, you know, one, a very interesting mathematical problem just in itself. Yeah, very cool. So when you read the Satoshi white paper, oh, and by the way, uh, you mentioned PGP. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with... Uh, Philip Zimmerman? Yeah, he was the, if I recall, the inventor of PGP, right? Or one of the co-founders of it. So we're trying to get him at our conference, actually. We've been speaking with him at our Monerotopia conference. So he's expressed interest. So I'm, I'm just throwing that out there to the fans that are listening. So uh, we might have Philip Zimmerman at the conference, which which should be very cool. That would definitely be a one to, to watch or attend. Um, sounds amazing. Yeah. Um, and we've had Richard Stallman on the show. Are you familiar with him? <laughs> That's a controversial figure. <laughs> yeah, he's a. That was a difficult interview. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna lie. That was a, He's an interesting communicator, but obviously a very intelligent guy, and also uh, was very early uh, in working on these ideas as well, right? Yeah, and and something you know you got to admire about him was he has very strong principles, and he's stuck to those principles through decades. Uh, and not many people can say that. So you know, definitely props to him for that. What I was surprised in my conversation with him was uh, he, you know, obviously he was very interested in this idea of digital cash and has you know kind of made his own at attempts at it, uh, but he saw issue philosophically i think in some respect with the idea of like true digital cash where you know it's completely anonymous and he was concerned about essentially the abilities of of governments to to tax it as as needed and things like that just curious what's kind of your philosophical standpoint on on this technology obviously digital cash uh encrypting the 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 way we we transact, uh, there's obviously a lot of good that comes with that, a lot of liberty that comes with that. But there's arguments to be made that you know uh, there might be some concerning features there. Do you have? Yeah, your... I've got a pretty strong opinion on this. So a lot of those arguments, I, I think, are uh, not really grounded in truth. So the, the number one um, uh, currency that's used for illicit activity by far and away is the U.S. dollar. Um, 
huge banks are constantly getting fined hundreds of millions of dollars for you know supporting money laundering or nefarious activities or you you name it um so the idea that having somehow an untraceable digital cash uh is going to be the cause of all this activity to me that's just ridiculous like it's happening right now with all these banks that are heavy regu heavily regulated supposed to have kyc aml laws in place and it's not stopping it However, <laughs> uh, the ability to have fully anonymous digital cash that you can self-custody and own is uh, <laughs> really the last bastion against authoritarian rule. And we've had just in the last couple of weeks a very telling for the West demonstration of what happens when authoritarianism starts to get hold. In Canada, they've frozen people's bank accounts for the crime of donating to a cause that they believed in. That is terrifying. Because, you know, Canada, strong Western liberal dem democracy was some of the most beautiful, polite people I've ever met in my life. And, and here they are turning off people's funds. What do we do? How do we, we, we tackle that? And that's where uh, technologies like Bitcoin, like Monero and the ability to self-custody just change the game. They change the balance of power to the side of liberty and the people, um, you know, without adding any more nefarious activities than is already happening in the current financial system. Yeah. No, great answer. Great answer. You, you, you covered <laughs> it all right there. I mean, that's what we are. Uh, we're constantly talking about on this show and it's kind of scary that we're seeing um, a real necessity for, for things like Monero uh, in, in a way we've never seen before. With these recent events, we saw that Bitcoin was kind of high, highly used and uh, we saw the outcome with that. What's your, your your reaction take on that? We saw that there, you know, potentially were some issues with the fact that Bitcoin, you know, is, is traceable and it really wasn't functioning in as digital cash is supposed to function. What's what's your kind of... What was your <laughs> so I have conspiracy theories around this, obviously, you know, no proof, but it seems awful convenient that there's this broadly adopted public ledger where all transactions can be seen and traced. Uh, it's a fantastic technology, don't get me wrong. The security and resilience of the Bitcoin network is par excellence and, and can't be uh, matched by pretty much any cryptocurrency. However, um, it has made it very, very easy for governmental organizations to keep a tab on where the money's going. And because it has this aura around it that it's pseudonymous and you can kind of make it private through mixes and, and other things. Uh, and it's been shown that governments can even circumvent some of those. I think there was a recent um, discussion by one of the uh, DAO hacks where they were able to trace who did it through a couple mixes. Um, and so all the, the the privacy recommendations from folks in the Bitcoin community have been, you know, get it on a non-KYC uh, platform, uh, use mixes, kind of make sure that your coins are private in some sense. And even that can be defeated um, unless you do it perfectly. So it's, it's fraught with some of those concerns from a privacy perspective. Uh, but let's, you know, step back as well. If you self-custodied your Bitcoin, they cannot take it away from you. And so that's a step ahead. Then you start to ask, well, how do I find an off ramp for it to be able to trade uh, and, and you know use it as a currency to purchase things? That's a whole other problem that you have because you know and I think Bitcoin and, and Monero both have that challenge. Where how do you find an off ramp once the government's identified that they want to stop this activity? Yeah, in terms of the unconfiscatability, I you know I'm I don't really I'm not totally sold on it with Bitcoin. Obviously, I know technically it, it's difficult, right? Uh, if somebody holds the private key. How do you take it away from them? But if you if you know where they are, who they are, and then they they have you know X amount of Bitcoin, um, can't can't the government just kind of show up and and take it away from you? I mean, sure. You know, at the end of the day, the government can show up with guns, and what are you going to do? Um, and you know, thankfully, I live in the United States, and we have other tools uh, to help prevent that particular uh, circumstance. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day. Uh, uh, you know, there's technologies you can use. You can have, uh, I think, certain wallets allow you to have a duress wallet, in a sense, um, and and so you can set that up. But at some point, we're all, we're all human, and and we'll be subject to threats like that. But it's very different to come and knock on your door and say, okay, give me your Bitcoin, versus press a button and freeze a hundred thousand people's accounts. 
And so the burden on the government is a lot higher. Uh, and so it's a lot more difficult for them to systemically do it across the entire nation to, to shut off funds. Do you think people that use Bitcoin now start thinking about things like Monero now that they're seeing, you know, the, the flaws with, with privacy and how it could have a real world effect? Do you think it's it kind of... I don't think it's into the consciousness yet fully. Um, I think, you know, step one is, you know, buy Bitcoin to hedge against inflation. You can argue how good of a hedge it's been, especially in, in the, the last couple of months and the performance of the markets. Um, most people leave it on exchanges. And so they're not actually any more protected from what we're talking about. Uh, I think the, the first step of awareness needs to be to get it into self-custody um, and to, to balance what you, you keep on exchanges for, you know, earning yield or whatever you're doing with it uh, with you're keeping your coins in self-custody and understanding how to manage that. It's not an easy thing just to say, uh, buy a ledger, put your Bitcoin on it, you're good. Because there's a whole other set of threats that come from self-custody, like forgetting your seed phrase or friendly MetaMask support contacts you and you share that your seed phrase because you need help and suddenly it's all gone. So there's different threats um, and different people are capable of addressing those threats in different ways. So I would never say to someone, you have to self-custody. I think that could be setting certain folks up for failure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I, when I was talking to Philip Zimmerman trying to get him to come to the conference, that's something he was like really harking on. Um, this, his concern is, you know, uh, how, how do we make sure people essentially don't lose their lose their private keys? You know, that's a, a real concern of his, um, and it should be right. Uh, since when have we ever been in control of all our wealth in a way where we we truly? Uh, own own it as a bearer asset and it could you know if we lose it it's gone and you know there's, there's no bank to call up there's no credit card company to call up it's just gone so yeah <laughs> and as we start to put more than just you know money onto that as we start to bring digital identity and other ways of securing our credentialing in the world what happens if you lose the password to your college degree did you just effectively not do college <laughs> that would be terrible <laughs> So how do you see that playing out? Just solutions with kind of like you were saying, like with multi-sig and things like that? Oh, I haven't thought deeply enough to, to understand what a solution like that uh, could be. Um, my sense is that there's probably some sort of multi-sig with institutions where they can restore identity through some other out-of-band proof mechanism, kind of off-chain proof mechanism. Um, you know, you go to the DMV and then suddenly you can load your license back onto your, your new uh, wallet if they were going that direction. But it's a, it's a hard problem. And I don't think we've tackled it as deeply, or at least I haven't seen folks tackling it as deeply. So just to, just to jump back, um, so you were interested in digital cash and you were exploring the ideas, obviously, before Bitcoin even existed. So did you think it was essentially impossible to do? Was that kind of your, your thinking at some point where you're like, well, this, you know, you, you just can't technically do it? Or did you always kind of see hope in that? Nobody had just figured it out. <laughs> yeah, so I always had hope. Um, you know, I was watching the from one corner of my eye what was going on with digital cash, um, but I could never in my mind figure out how we could get beyond some centralized authority, even if we could hide the contents of the transactions from that centralized authority, and there was lots of cryptographic protocols to do that, um, how we could be resilient against their failure. Um, and it, I just, I couldn't grok the whole, <laughs> the, the whole idea of being truly decentralized. Um, so when you came finally did really come across Bitcoin and you took a good look at it, where you're like, that's it? Or was there still, was there still, <laughs> still out there? Or did it kind of how did it hit you? It was, it was, I felt it was pretty shady, to be honest. So I first came across Bitcoin, I think it was 2013. And you know, it was there was lots of people mining Bitcoin and uh, there was a community that was forming around it. So I thought, okay, I'll you know get involved and I'll you know get a little Bitcoin. I, at the time I, I didn't have enough time to you know set up and do the full uh, you know mining myself. But I'm like, okay, how do I buy this thing? And that led me down the rabbit hole eventually to Mount Gox. And that whole experience just felt like sketchy, sketchy, sketchy. Uh, it ended up being sketchy, <laughs> as it turns out. And so I didn't jump in then. Um, and I'll admit, part of me thought it was just a Ponzi scheme. Like, why would it have any value at all? I could see it as a as a way to transact currency, but I couldn't see that would would accrue larger and larger value over time. Now, you know, in hindsight, it's obvious that that was was going to happen as it grew in adoption, but it wasn't really a certain thing back then. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
So the the decentralization of it, did that grab hold of you? Did you kind of grasp the fact that, you know, Bitcoin figured out the Byzantine generals problem and all that jazz? You know, I'll say, honestly, I think I was clouded by a lot of the, the, the FUD about Bitcoin at the time and the idea that it was used for underground illicit activities um, and every other thing I would read would have some negative connotation of it. And I was hesitant to get involved with what seemed like a seedy underground of the internet. Um, you know, even though it, it on the surface represented promise, my impression was that it was really enabling the criminal element. Now, you know, over time that turned out to not actually be the case. And most of the uses of Bitcoin are legitimate. I think last was 0. 0.0015 or something of that order, um, illicit activity on the Bitcoin network in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and then obviously, so Monero has kind of, or is taking Bitcoin's place for these more nefarious uses. Uh, at least that seems to be the claim, right? So I, I'm not sure I'd lead with that as the advertisement for Monero. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, it depends. You know, I think it's I think it's a good adver advertisement in that it <laughs> showcases that it works as intended. Uh, obviously, not everybody sees it that way. Um, I guess, so do you then see it that way? Do you, do you see kind of the, uh, value proposition of, of true crypto being something that essentially is anonymous, private, unstoppable? Absolutely. So I have to give props to my brother who was really pushing Monero hard uh, on me. Cause I'm like, okay, it's just another, you know, privacy coin, whatever. People don't really value their privacy that much as we've seen with, with web two and Google and Facebook. Um, and he was really passionate about it from the perspective I think we're all coming to of it is a defense against um, nation states that could go hostile against their citizens. And it gives you some measure of privacy and transactions and autonomy of your own life. And so the Bitcoin folks like to talk about the self-sovereign individual. And I think Monero gets closer to enabling that. Um, at the time when I was first looking at Bitcoin, I got to say I had more trust in our institutions. And the, the, the balance of, well, how much can it be used for illicit activities versus the amount of freedom it gave didn't seem to, to weigh up, given the context of what's happened in the last two years. Uh, very much, I think it, Monero is a fantastic tool for allowing people to get a bit more freedom and, and self-sovereignty. And you came from, you worked at Google, you worked at Microsoft as well? I did, yes. So, I mean, you you kind of experience firsthand the the power that these companies have and the uh, ability of them to collect data and use that data to their advantage. Um, was that something you've you've kind of always thought about, whether you were cognizant of, uh, you know, that they that they were amassing this massive amount of power and potentially ability to manipulate or control people with it? Yeah, so when I was at Microsoft, uh, they were very much less in terms of gathering data. They were still making the transition from applications on the desktop to web services. So they hadn't fully embraced the, the model of, of gathering data. And when I, when I joined Google, it was in the era still of uh, don't be evil. And that was an ethos that very strongly resonated with me. Um, so one of the impetuses for me uh, leaving Microsoft and joining Google was at the time, um, Microsoft was bringing some of their services to China and there was some human, human rights abuses that China was, was doing. I forget exactly what it was. And Google had decided to pull their search engine out of China, take a tremendous business loss and lean on the ideals of don't be evil. And I thought to myself, that's a company I'd like to contribute my life force to and, and really push their mission forward. And even when you get inside, there was very much that ethos of the people there of like, yeah, we're doing something good for humanity. So it wasn't the sense of we're gathering data to try and get the most data out there and somehow do something evil. It was very much like, how can we make the services that we offer more awesome? And you'd speak to even people from the ad side. It's like, how can we show a more relevant ad? And yes, you'll click on it, but it's also more useful for you. So there's sort of a win, win, win embedded in the situation. I was also at Google when they deprecated, don't be evil. And that was a really tough moment for me. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of outcry internally at the company at that. Unfortunately, I think the deprecation of don't be evil really marked 
a process that had already happened rather than the start of a process. And I, I think now, you know, Google's under a lot of pressure from regulators and from, from the users, frankly, to drive more into offering that level of privacy and ownership of data. And you know, one of the reasons that I joined Permission was to help push that mission forward of allowing people to own their data and to get a fair cut in the value exchange of their data and, and not to be at a large tech company that was taking it all. I didn't think that was an appropriate space to be you know, pushing forward. Have you read, did you ever read the book, Who Owns the Future? Um, I don't think I have, no. Oh, I'm forgetting the author's name, but uh, that was a real eye opener for me uh, is when I first got into Bitcoin too. I think it was like, yeah, I think I read the book in like 2014 or 2015. And he, yeah, he basically talks about, you know, the siren servers, the Google servers and the fan, mm -hmm. how they're just sucking in everyone's data. And it was, it was at a, uh, written at a time where it wasn't as obvious as it, I feel like it is today. Uh, surveillance capitalism, I guess, is another way of uh, describing it. So was there some point where w when you're working with with them, obviously, so they got rid of the the don't be evil tagline. Um, was there a point where you're like, where you kind of saw the writing on the wall, like, well, all right, maybe they don't want to be evil, but it's just the nature of this this company that they're going to tend towards acquiring more and more people's data for the purposes of making more money. Um, was that kind of, was there a moment for you where you're like, it's just, this is inevitable with. There was actually, that wasn't so much the moment about, about privacy, but there were three th things that happened in short succession from each other. And I forget the exact order that they happened. Um, one of them was that Google, was discovered that they were working in secret, even in secret from their employees who were working on the project, a search engine for China. And one of the things that was embedded in that search engine was that they would give the Chinese government, I think it was your, your phone number or some personally identifiable detail, uh, along with the search queries that you'd searched, and they would be censoring the search results. So the fact that they did this all in secret without telling the people working on the project, and the fact that um, they were even just doing this. Like this was not a thing that Google of 10 years before would have done. Uh, it was really shocking. So that was one thing that happened. Um, the second thing that happened was the, uh, there was a project I think called Project Maven where Google's working with the Department of Defense to help bring machine learning to support some of their, their systems. And, you know, it's fine, government contractors, uh, no problem. But the fact that it was really hidden from folks and that they were trying to do it in a way that was, outside of the awareness of the company meant that they felt like they had something to hide to me. Um, and then the third thing that happened was there was a memo that was, was published broadly by a guy named James Damore. And you can disagree with the, the memo. I don't think it was very smart of what he, what he published. Um, but the, the response in the company uh, was very strongly against that free flowing of ideas, even bad ideas. Um, and up until then, for me, Google had always been a place where you could share ideas, you could learn, you could grow, you could challenge each other. Um, and people were very outspoken. I was, you know, I was blown away that folks would ask at our regular TGIF meetings, uh, you know, Larry and Sergey were there. These billionaires taking random questions from the audience, and sometimes they'd be really hard questions. And that was very impressive to me. Uh, but then seeing that that uh, quality of discussion change and and not be as robust. So those are the three things that got me thinking. Okay, something deep has changed about the culture of the company. And so, do you think any centralized tech company that's kind of in the business of offering services in exchange for <laughs> user data is going to head in that same direction? That is a tough question, because <clears throat> if anyone could have done it, Google would have been the company. Um, I think the reality of the situation is that once you grow past a certain size, once you have a certain number of employees who no longer fully share the ethos of what you started, uh, it's inevitable that it will stray from that ethos. Um, I think it's uh, Charles Hoskinson from Cardano who likes to say that can't be evil is greater than don't be evil. And I think that's the world we need to, to move into. That's the Web3 world of can't be evil. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so do you see regulations also playing a role too, or it's really more about building tech that can't be evil? I don't think regulations are really going to help. 
So you take the, the recent privacy regulations, GDPR and CCPA, uh, which regulate everything from showing users cookie dialogues to how the data can be used. And you'll see a couple things happen. One thing that happens is that the very large companies can quickly hire a team of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 people to go and meet these regulations and work around them appropriately and put everything up there. And what it ends up doing is strengthening their monopolies in a particular area. So Google, Facebook, Amazon, their ad businesses have grown stronger in the face of this regulation and they've had more control. Second thing that happens is the industry starts to find ways to try and work around it. And so one thing I was shocked as I dived into ad tech uh, at permission was to discover that <clears throat> even with all the cookie dialogues and the cookie laws, there is data now being passed server to server. So your data is being passed around as just circumventing the letter of the law in a certain way. And eventually the law will catch up and then there'll be some new way for data to be passed around. Um, because the system is incentivized in a way that, I don't maybe adversarial is the right word, adversarial to users. And I think as we build Web3, it's not about win-lose, it's about sharing and the value created. How can advertisers get value? How can users get value and build that shared relationship together? And do you think it's essential, uh, essential for the systems themselves to be uh, completely decentralized or, or, or at least federated? Or do you think there's going to be some versions where uh, mm. there's centralized control? I think all of these systems need to start out in a centralized fashion. Um, even, even most you know, blockchains started out fairly centralized as they build and they grow. The key is when and how quickly do you get to decentralize it? Because once it gets too large, as we, we talked about, beyond a certain size, other incentives kick in that aren't necessarily grounded in the ethos of where you originally started. So I don't think any centralized authority, whether it's a corporation or a government, can ultimately continue to not be evil. And so obviously I I'm a, agree with everything you're saying. I love, <laughs> I, Monero people are going to love it. Everybody's shaking their head like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, there's the regulators and, and those that are in, in charge of the government, those who are currently making the laws. I think a lot, of the, a lot of them look at crypto and particularly cryptos like Monero and they're seeing the negatives. It could be used for money laundering. It could be used for financing terrorism. And they're concerned. They want to regulate these technologies. They're not seeing the long-term vision of, no, the world will eventually be actually a better place when these things are uh, implemented and adopted. So how do you think we get there? Do we get there? Do we get to the point where governments start fully embracing these technologies and helping to grow their adoption. I mean, obviously we've already mm -hmm. seen parts of the world. I don't know how genuine it is, but in, in a genuine sense, especially here in the United States, just curious what your take is on that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. You've seen a lot of politicians lately uh, jump on the bandwagon as it were of Bitcoin. Um, I, I think the most stunning example of someone who jumped on the bandwagon just to gain popularity was the recent mayor of New York, where I saw something that said he supports Bitcoin, just not Bitcoin mining. <laughs> like, how does that even work? <laughs> I don't, don't understand. Right. Um, so it didn't seem very genuine. He's a number go up guy. He wants to get his check in Bitcoin <laughs> and see, see you go up in value. Uh, now, there's other politicians. Um, I think Cynthia, I forget her last name, from Wyoming, who seems yeah. very genuinely serious about the ethos of you know Bitcoin and crypto and what it can bring for personal uh, freedoms and, and liberty. It is challenging for governments to give up control. Um, and I, I think every time in history, humanity has tried to create essentially a decentralized system. That's what a democracy or a republic is, right? It's trying to diffuse the power. Um, it, it ends up tending towards more centralization. And you've seen you know, the size of governments grow, even governments that are trying to do good things. And I think most governments start out that way. Um, they, they get heavyweight and you have these bureaucracies that are trying to you know, regulate various different industries to make life better for citizens. I mean, that hopefully is the goal. But you don't have out of a thousand people, every person being pure and good. There's always going to be folks with ulterior motives. Yeah, 100 percent. That's the problem with centralized uh, companies and governments. Um, I 
I, I do see hope though, especially here in the U S I ran for Congress, for example, in 2020. So like, and I'm a, an idealist in all the ways that we're talking about right, right now. And so, you know, I think there's a lot, there's more of me and there's more of the people that are, are, are now, you know, uh, gaining their own kind of independent power with the growth of crypto. And maybe we'll start to see them get involved in government and start to, you know, change the way, uh, government, government. I am extremely hopeful for the U S I, I think it just runs through our blood that this idea of freedom, um, I'm a little more concerned with places that are pushing uh, central bank digital currencies, mm -hmm. there seems to be a race between the adoption of fully decentralized crypto like Bitcoin and CBDCs. And I'm going to be very strong. CBDC is the end of human liberty. <laughs> if any country or nation implements that, we are lost. Uh, there's a reason that China is rushing so quickly into the digital one. It's because they can control every last thing you do. They can see what you spend, where you go. They can shut your money off. Uh, they can make it so you can only spend on certain things, certain government approved things. Um, if your social credit score drops below a certain level, maybe you don't get to buy food that week. Uh, and that's a very swift lesson. Um, and so I worry more about the oncoming of CBDCs than necessarily regulations in our existing industry. Because I think the, the, the race is to get adoption of decentralized cryptos before CBDCs take hold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of it's the ultimate right panopticon to have a CBDC. Uh, I mean, I see it. I kind of see it as an, a necessary evolution. Uh, so obviously, you know, it's kind of part of the game theory way things are going to play out. Governments want to want to play in this game. They want to try to compete against crypto. So first thing they're going to try to, you know, first they tried to kill it, right, or whatever. First <laughs> they ignored it, then they tried to kill it. Now they're trying to, you know, I guess uh, compete against it with something like a CBDC. But my hope is ultimately that opens people's eyes unless governments are somehow able to, I guess the scary scenario is if they can onboard people with incentives. So yeah. I'm use our CBDC because whatever you'll get amazing interest rates or, you know, things that will kind of funnel people into it is a concern. Uh, but my hope is as they use it, they'll realize that there's these other options that aren't controlled and sur surveilled by governments. Yeah, I think you have a fantastic point there. I'm very hopeful that as the government looks to regulate uh, things like USDC, that that could serve as essentially a pseudo CBDC without all the Orwellian controls um, and still give you know all the benefits of having a, a digital currency that can be easily transacted and shared everywhere. Um, and USDC is fantastic because it runs on multiple blockchains. So it's really agnostic to a lot of the systems that are in place right now. Um, that seems a much preferable situation to a Fed coin or something similar. Do you think we'll see any bannings of Monero anywhere? Monero <laughs> it seems to be the the target. We've, we've seen well, listings. Do you think we'll see a government trying to, you know, a large government trying to ban the use of Monero? I think when China finally bans Bitcoin, they'll move on to trying to ban Monero. <laughs> but you know, in general, Bitcoin, I can't keep up. I know. <laughs> They seem to ban it every other year. Yeah. Um, but I do think, you know, I do think Monero is a target. Even as you look today, it's very difficult to, to find it. The the only exchange I'm aware of is Kraken, that you can actually buy it and then bring it to your own personal self-custody wallet. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. May, there may be others. I'm sure you're more familiar than I am. No, in the in the U.S., Kraken is, yeah, the, the only one where you can buy uh, Monero, essentially, with your bank account directly. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like, you know, there is definitely a squeeze that's happening. Um, I could see regulation coming because at the end of the day, the governments want to tax you as well. And a fully private coin makes it very difficult for them to do that. Uh, Bitcoin is actually fantastic. You know, from a government's perspective, they should absolutely want it. They should want the number to go up and they should want to collect all those taxes from folks who are very wealthy in crypto. Um, that seems like the incentives are all aligned there. Uh, Monero is different because they can't see what's happening. Yes, yeah, so do you think the US we see we kind of see some some dark days with that or we it, it, we don't get to that point. Um I don't I mean maybe I'm giving the regulators too little credit. I think they're going to start with the the big threats. Um the big threats being basically blatant scams. There's so many blatant scams out there in crypto. 
Uh, I believe that's where the SEC should be focusing. Um, they're going to try and figure out what to do with Bitcoin and Ethereum and, and the large cryptocurrencies in general. And I would say it's probably five to 10 years before they have a legitimate strong look at privacy coins and, and regulating them. But maybe I'm too optimistic. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of these these politicians and officials like to to run around and act like they're, you know, pr protecting the people, protecting the children. Um, so I'm, I'm afraid that you might see some people out there calling for, you know, the banning of, of digital cash, true digital cash. You've kind of seen some already alluding to it. Um, so permission.io, tell, tell me more about it. So is it, is it open source? Is it, is it a centralized company? Uh, Tell me more yeah. About yeah, so we're, we're very early in our journey. Um, you know, from a vision perspective, uh, we're about Web3 web advertising and allowing users to own their data and earn from their data. Really a response to all the regulation that's happening on the ad side from privacy. And, you know, really wanting to change the, really the ethos of the ad world to allow people to form a direct connection with, with brands on an opt-in basis. So we're focusing on how can we plug into the existing ecosystem and start to advocate some of the Web3 principles and, and bring them to life. Uh, we're very, very early on in that. So we are a centralized company. Uh, we'll likely stay a centralized company for a meaningful amount of time. Our technology is plugging into and the existing system. We're starting with the ability for advertisers to reward people in crypto. But ultimately, you can look at the ad system. There's a fantastic diagram out there that shows all the pieces of the ad ecosystem from advertisers using demand side platforms all the way over to publishers who are looking at supply and the exchanges and the bidders and everything that's in between there. And you can imagine a world where all of that is Web3 enabled, all of that is decentralized, all of that works on the principle of opt-in and sharing the value exchange. I'd say that's a big, bold vision. It's probably a decades or two decade long process for the company to get through. Um, but we need to start right now and offer value to users and to advertisers. So that's a long way of saying not yet. <laughs> um, but I think in the ethos of the people working in the company, we aspire to bring all the benefits of Web3 into the ad ecosystem. And so is it, is it working? Is it is it being used anywhere? What's the current? Uh... Yeah, so we have our, um, our own uh, token or, or coin right now, uh, ASK. That's, that we're using for digital rewards. We also have a crypto rewards demand side platform. And we've had a few advertisers so far working on our alpha. We're currently in beta for that. We have some large clients that we're talking with. And so it's very, very early on. The idea is to prove the model of sharing in the value exchange um, and then to grow that into other parts of providing value. So we look at users and say, well, how can we offer users something, maybe a mobile app or a browser extension that allows them to keep ownership of their data, but also allows them to offer it up in exchange for something that's a value for them, for, for crypto, for example, in a way that they can form relationships with brands. Uh, you know, I'll give you an example. I, you know, I love yoga and I'm quite happy if Lululemon wants to advertise me their latest offering. In fact, I'd rather see that ad as I browse the website than an ad for anything else. Um, but right now there's no way for me to express, okay, Lululemon, you can know who I am. But all the other shady advertisers, I don't want you to know anything about me. And as far as you're concerned, I'm just a ghost walking around the internet. Um, the, I think an interesting distinction to draw here is, are you familiar with Brave Browser? Yeah, I was going to ask you about BAT, right? The basic attention token. Right? Yeah, so I think, you know, Brave is fantastic. And they, they offer a very specific service, which is for people who want to be completely anonymous. Unfortunately that doesn't work very well in a world where most of the websites are funded by ads because the ads aren't very effective if you know nothing about the person. Personalization is there not just to get more money for the advertisers, but also to support a better experience for users. Uh, and so I think Brave if has, I'm gonna say erred is maybe a strong word, um, but erred on the side of being completely private in all situations. And we're trying to take the middle ground and say, okay, Privacy is very important. Your data has value. And how can you opt in to share that and get an exchange of value in return for it and allow the ecosystem that's on the web today, supported by advertising, to continue to work just in an opt-in way? Mm -hmm. And how about the BAT token? 
so you, like what you guys are doing compared to the basic at attention token? Yeah, so I don't uh, know fully the, the tokenomics of, of BAT, and I need to be careful because my lawyer's like, don't talk about our tokenomics and our token and numbers going up or down or wherever. Um, but as far as you know, our token, we do have a limited supply of 100 billion. Uh, it is um, slowly released over time. I think, if I recall, you know, 40 or 50 billion over the next um, five or six years. So it's a fairly slow release. Um, BAT, I don't know if they have a fixed supply. Actually, I should do a little more research on their token. So I'm going to pause there. Okay. But same basic concept, right? Where people are being rewarded tokens uh, for the attention that they're giving to ads. Very similar. So Brave and BAT rewards you for your attention. Uh, where we're trying to move towards is to reward you for sharing your data. So less about an active thing that you need to do and more about the, the, the sharing of the data. One could imagine an experience, and we, we've talked about how we would build this, where as users browse the internet, they can selectively choose which sites or brands to share data with, and they can accrue value as they browse. So you could, you could um, without having to watch a particular ad or without having to devote your attention to something, get rewarded for the fact that you are choosing to share your data. And then, you know, is the, is the data ultimately, um, you know, kept private or? Yeah. <laughs> this is the dirty little secret of the entire ad ecosystem. Yeah. That once your data is out there, it's almost impossible to pull it back. And so this is where we have to replumb the digital advertising system and make it Web3 uh, in order for you to be able to claw back your data and to have full control over it. Um, owning your data right now, it's, I'd say it's not fully expressed in product truth in any product that I've seen. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we've had very early discussions about how can we use something like zero knowledge proofs to right. allow advertisers to know a little bit more about you without actually knowing who you are in your data and to allow you to cryptographically kind of take back that permission from exactly. advertisers. That's, many years off, unfortunately. And there's, there's a lot of work that the team needs to do to get to that point. Uh, but me, I, personally, I, I'm very excited about that because that changes the relationship you have as you browse the internet and brings the ownership of data. Just like we've talked about ownership of money, this can bring true ownership of data. Right, Because I, 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 but I guess the concern can be that permission.io then just becomes this huge silo of, of data. Uh... Of people's data and they're, they're using it so people are getting rewarded um but at the end of the day all that data is being held in this centralized system that's susceptible to you know attacks if, if not permission that io taking advantage of it perhaps some other entity exactly that, that that's a very good good point and i think you know the more we can decentralize the true ownership of that data and have it be kind of opt-in at the time that people are wanting to use it without these large central stores of that data, that moves us to a world where we have more privacy. Now, there's tons of challenges there around scalability and performance. Some of these real-time bidding systems, they need to react and offer ads you know, less than 200 milliseconds. And, and so we need to figure out how all of that works very, very early in that technology investigation. Very cool, very cool. So how do you see this all, obviously big question here, how do you see it all playing out? I mean, uh, what, what do you think the future looks like 10, 20 years in terms of how we're interacting with the internet and you know whether or not we're controlling our own data and what, what do you think it's gonna look like? <laughs> um, I didn't think the last two years would happen, so I don't know how much of a sage I can be. Okay. Um, I think there's at least three worlds that we could live in. Uh, world number one, is a world where people have realized the harm that digital systems have caused to them as humans. And they work to spend more time in mindful practices away from technology. I think that's the kind of yoga side of me coming through and, and hoping that we get back to more of our humanity. I'd give that the lowest percentage chance of all of this happening, just given where everything's going. I'm ready uh, for that. You're ready for that. <laughs> um, world number two, uh, which I think a lot of large centralized companies like Facebook are pushing for is that we just recreate the metaverse in the mold of web two. 
And so we have all these centralized authorities. Maybe they're not Google and Facebook and Amazon. Maybe they're the Web3 versions of those folks, but they're not actually doing Web3. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just all centralized and, and controlled. And people don't mind because the idea of ownership can be scary and complicated. Unfortunately, I think that's the most likely scenario that happens. And then the third scenario, which is the one I'm hoping to try and help build, is one where people actually have ownership of their data, of their money. Uh, all the Web3 vision that you, you see around people owning their own path on the internet and us building tools so you can't be evil. And, and that's what I hope happens if people remain online that we can get to that point. It's going to be a struggle. It's going to be a fight. Um, I like to show, uh, 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 there's this great um, meme where you've got a WWF and you know one of the guys is web one and the person dragging the, the guy away is web two and the web one guy is trying to tag in web three. But all those web two companies like Google and Facebook are just trying to stop him from, from allowing the web to fully evolve into what web three wants it to be. So how do we push people into this third version um, I know, I mean, I'm, I'm going down that road, you know, I'm, I'm all Monero. I, I have my Monero. I, 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 I'm ready to live in a world where I can transact with other people peer to peer, send them digital cash, but yeah, I'm an idealist. How do we move people there? How do we incentivize them? I think there's three things we have to do. First is to build. We have to build the systems that are easy, open, and accessible for everyone to use. I'll, I'll use an example of one of my, my favorite blockchains, uh, Elrond. They have an app called Meyer app, which is the easiest way to self-custody I've seen across any single app. We need more apps and tools like that. So we need to build on-ramps that people can use. The second thing I need, I think we need to do is to come together. I mean, if you've been on crypto Twitter for any length of time, you've got Bitcoin Maxi shouting at Ethereum Maxis who all hate Cardano, who you know also doesn't like Terra Luna because of this and that. It's like, it's not each project against each other project, even though it may seem like that. The whole pie is bigger. The whole vision is bigger. Um, and then thirdly, I think we need to find ways to effectively govern some of these projects that the whole space is littered with with DAOs that have tried something and they weren't really a DAO or there was infighting or the pure democracy didn't work it's a really tough challenge to say okay we want to distribute the power to everyone we have a token that gives you governance over it but also we don't want you know mass rule to determine uh, very technical details of a protocol and that's not helpful um, so there's lots of lots of places that are tackling it. I'm, I'm very excited to see the work that the um, Cardano folks are doing on their Voltaire uh, era, where they're trying to think about how do you do governance in a way that, that balances, you know, how much influence you have, depending on how much stake you have, depending on your expertise. They're super early. It's, a, it's an insanely hard problem. And I'd say if we can crack that one, basically we can crack how government should work. Um, so mm. to, to summarize, I think we need to do three things. We need to build we need to come together and we need to find strong governance mechanisms. What do you think of the way a project like Monero is essentially governed? Do you have any opinions there on, on how it? Works? I'll be honest, I don't uh, know too much about how it's governed. Well, similar to the way Bitcoin is, um, you know, just open source, people contribute, uh, but there's just not a very good kind of structure there in terms of uh you know how decisions get made i mean they they happen you know in a, in a decentralized way um but just curious do you have any have any comments on on that and on how bitcoin does it and... yeah so i think you know it's fraught because the incentives aren't aligned between all parties uh, so if you take the the bitcoin world there's the the core developers who have their own particular perspective <clears throat> excuse me you have uh miners who would like to keep mining and, and supporting the investment that they've made in mining rigs. And then you have users who don't really have a whole lot of say in the system. So in, in the proof of work system, my understanding is that the, the miners and the core developers have most of the power. And even though the core developers, you know, it's open source, there is still some protocol in terms of who gets elected as a core developer, 
which which code changes get merged in. Um, there's a lot about that which I don't think is strongly governed. Um, and so you could potentially see an attack on Bitcoin that comes not from the cryptographic angle or trying to outmine the, the, the blockchain and reverse blocks, but attacking the core set of Bitcoin developers. And I think there's only three or four dozen of them right now. So it's not a large a, a, attack surface that you have to go after. Yeah, yeah, no, that's what I was getting at. Very good points. Uh, I, I mean, in Monero, what's, what's nice about it is... A, a lot of the developers, a lot of the main developers have managed to stay anonymous, which I think is is important. I think especially as you're trying to defend against, you know, attacks from very well-funded governments, uh, that's important. Although I don't think folks have as much anonymity as they, they think they do. It's very, very difficult to stay fully anonymous. A slight slip up and, you know, they'll find you. I've seen governments are offering bounties for folks who can crack Monero. So it's definitely in their crosshairs. I'm sure there's a plethora of three-letter agencies that are looking into it. I think they just arrested someone from the Monero core dev team when he landed in the US. Um, oh, yeah. Ricardo. Yeah, he was the, the maintainer of Monero for, for years. Um, he was kind of the face of the of Monero. Uh, and, you know, uh, it, was, it was unfortunate to see, obviously. And uh, I know him. I know him personally. I don't know him super well, but uh, he seems like a great guy. Uh, so unfortunate to, to see that happen. But I would say kind of the the silver lining is that we saw that, you know, he he isn't, you know, the uh, centralized figure that people made him out to be. That, you know, a lot of people cri were critical of Monero saying it's too centralized and essentially controlled by, you know, Ricardo Spagni, Fluffy Pony. And that's that's most certainly not the case. And it became, I think, more obvious to people when, when this incident happened. Yeah, I mean, that, that's great. Lisa. Some aspect of decentralization is good. Uh, in the Cardano world, they, they talk a lot about the minimum attack vector in terms of the number of stake pools uh, that, that entities that you'd have to corrupt in order to corrupt the network. And even there, it's on the order of 25 right now, which is a very, very low number. If you think about a blockchain that could potentially be settling hundreds of billions of dollars worth of transaction value. How about the mining network itself? Are you familiar with RandomX and how Monero is mined? Um, the only thing I know about it is it was designed so that anyone can mine it. Um, and so it's it's resistant to ASIC attack, as it were. Uh, now, you know, how true that is and whether the NSA has figured out a way around that, I, I don't know. But I think the in principle, the idea is good. It's very egalitarian. Yeah, do you uh, do you think it's it's kind of ultimately necessary for a proof of work coin to to be mined in that way? Is like should that be the like the goal, or at least one that's trying to be digital cash, universal digital cash? It's a tricky question because uh, with Bitcoin, with the way you're forced to invest so much in hardware in order to mine it, that itself becomes a defense against an attack. It's not like a government's going to go and get you know ten thousand ASICs just overnight. I mean, well, it's very, very, very easy to, extremely easy to. You just, you just knock on the door of the company <laughs> that owns ten thousand ASICs. Uh, I mean, I guess that is true, right? There's always that that kind of attack, and so that in the sense that you can, de you know, put in one area, you know, it's, it, you've done the work for the government. Uh, you know, I think you, you've actually convinced me that may, <laughs> maybe a more distributed system amongst users uh, is, is perhaps more worthwhile. Although, you know, to counter that, couldn't you just rent a bunch of compute power off Amazon and attack Monero? Yeah, Monero's got, Monero has to deal with that, I guess, until, until the day that it, it is large enough and enough people are, are mining it. Yeah, it, it currently has that, I would say, has that issue. So, so how does Monero tackle that? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious. Uh, I guess it tackles it by growing. Um, so the network becomes large enough where there's enough native mining power, people that are mining Monero, uh, that to attack it by renting software, I guess the game theory just would no longer work out. Um, but, you know, that that comes with growth and adoption. I mean, the early days, yeah. Bitcoin had that that problem in the early days as well, right? Uh, where where it seemed like people could more easily mount a 51% attack or something. Yeah, that's definitely fair. And I think it's one reason why 
I, I don't think there's room for too many proof of work net, networks to be sustainable and survive. Um, just because there's only so much power to go around and there's, there's a, they're only going to get to a certain size. Proof of stake networks have the same challenge based on market cap. You know, how quickly can you get to 51% of the market cap and, and essentially execute an attack like that? Yeah, I don't, I don't have a, I don't, I don't understand. I don't have a very good, um, understanding of proof. Of, I mean, I, I know what it is, but not well enough to, to criticize it on a deep level. What, what is, what, what, what do you ultimately think on the comparisons between the two proof of work, proof of stake? I think people would, could argue that proof of work is more secure from a couple angles. Uh, one is that it requires real physical work. So you have to have machines mining doing things. Um, two is that it, it has a tangible benefit for the energy ecosystem and it, it encourages innovation in energy. It allows you to essentially turn energy into cash, uh, which is just a phenomenal property that Bitcoin and, and Monero have. Um, so I think those are two of its advantages. I think, I, I mean, they're under attack now from a regulatory perspective around climate and the, the amount of energy they use. I think that's misguided, but it's a very complex and new, nuanced uh, counter to what people are saying. So if you're, if you're trying to convince the public of something, they'll just say, oh, look at how much power these Bitcoin miners have used. And, and, and then it creates regulatory pressure on them. So there's, there's that, that risk as well. Um, yeah, and then the, the, the comments about proof of stake are, you know, one, it can be more easily moved around the world. So we saw what happened with, with China when they banned mining. It was a very difficult process to get the hash rate in Bitcoin back up to where it was, like it required moving physical machines. In a proof of stake world, it's as easy as just setting up a server in another country and then moving your stake to that place. Um, so it has that property that it can flow more easily based on uh, local regulations. Uh, but it, it's also susceptible to, you could imagine a government printing a bunch of money and buying up that coin and then saying, okay, now I've got this coin. They just printed it out of thin air. Uh, so the, the idea that the market cap is truly a counter to a 51% attack, I hope will never get tested. Um, and as the, the market cap is large enough, it might be very difficult for a government to do it unnoticed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have any opinion with regards to Monero's dynamic block size? Have you have you looked into that at all? That's a little bit beyond my technical okay. understanding. You haven't gotten there yet. I, <laughs> look into it. So obviously, I mean, as, as from the terminology, as I'm sure you could, you could imagine. So Monero's it doesn't have a fixed block size, but it, it expands and contracts based on you know the amount of usage that the the blockchain has. Uh, That's a fantastic property because I think uh, as you look at a lot of these high TPS layer ones, they're creating a very, very large blockchain. Um, and one of the concepts I think is underappreciated in that is this idea of inclusive accountability, that everyone can run a node, download the entire blockchain, verify the transactions. You don't have to have a supercomputer or a high bandwidth network. Um, and I, I believe Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cardano, and Monero all have that similar, you know, very small ultimate blockchain size that allows for inclusive accountability. What are your thoughts on, you know, layer one blockchain versus building additional layers on top of it? <laughs> now you're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? So I think there's a trade-off. Um, the one thing about having a high TPS layer one is that it makes the, the addressing very simple. So you have one address, you can send tokens there, it just works, it's really fast. Um, networks like you know, Elrond or Terra Luna do this fantastically well, and you don't really have to think about scalability from all the perspectives of an end user, things just work fast. Uh, however, what that does is that forces your, your settlement layer effectively to grow really large in terms of the blockchain size, and it doesn't allow for the level of flexibility that I think we'll start to see in future applications. So I'm very much a fan of the, the work that Ethereum's doing with how they're thinking about uh, ZK rollups and, and layer twos. Um, Cardano is also moving in that direction with their Hydra scaling solution, uh, where we push a lot of this, this custom um, and it's sort of high throughput and uh, custom functionality into a layer two and really use layer one as the core settlement layer. So it allows you to do things, for example, have a protocol that's completely different and customized to a niche vertical that maybe it, it runs a different set of robustness rules or a different set of scale or includes a lot more data with each transaction or whatever you want it to be. 
uh, and then ultimately periodically settle back to layer one. Um, it also allows you to do some of the stuff that they're doing with ZK rollups and introduce new kind of privacy uh, views on uh, on the blockchain. And I'm not fully versed in any of that, so I don't want to go too deep into how you can use ZK rollups right now. I guess we'll, we'll round off the conversation here. We're just going back to the digital cash where we, where we started. Um, it's it's my my belief, and I think a lot of people in Monero share it that you know, a, a true cryptocurrency should be private by default. Uh, and perhaps more important, so where every unit equals every other unit. Uh, it's believed that Monero has achieved that and that, you know, a coin like Bitcoin, because of its transparent, fundamentally can't be fungible because each, essentially each coin has its own transaction history. What, what's your opinion of that? Do you, do you think digital cash needs to be truly fungible at the end of the day or something like Bitcoin can work as cash despite its lack of fungibility? It depends on your goals. Or do you ultimately see Bitcoin as being fungible in, in, in some way? Yeah, so I'll start with that. That one's an easy one. Bitcoin isn't fungible. You've seen them already target uh, certain... Um, Bitcoin, depending on transactions it's been used in and freezing it on exchanges. So very much you're able to target particular units of Bitcoin um, based on the, the public blockchain. So you can't trade one for another. I've even heard that um, rawly mined Bitcoin has a slightly higher value than Bitcoin that has a history. Um, I, I think we need to think about what are the goals that we're trying to accomplish. So if we're just looking to do transactions online uh, in a way that's, you know, mostly secure, that's mostly private most of the time. Uh, Bitcoin serves a lot of those needs. But if we imagine a world that no longer has dollar bills or a world where there is no unit of value to exchange one-to-one -one in a purely anonymous fashion, we need something like Monero. Uh, we need a way to transact purely anonymously that can't be broken um, within the world. And it has to be private by default because otherwise people are going to continue to screw up. I think that's my biggest challenge with solutions like Zcash is you have the option. And it's not always obvious which option you're choosing. Um, I think fully private by default all the time, you know you're using Monero and you know you're private. That's a good property. Um, and you know, often people will say, well, if you need privacy, then you must have something to hide. That's bunk. <laughs> like, there's lots of things people want privacy for in their life. It doesn't mean that they're nefarious. It just means that they're wanting to fully express who they are in a way that they don't want the entire world to know about. I mean, you could be our new fluffy pony. Uh, since you, since you <laughs> I don't know. I'd like to stay out of jail or where, wherever <laughs> folks on Monero are going. So, you know, I'll stick with permission. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is, this is great. Some, some really great uh, sound beats and lines there. You really, you really understand the importance of digital cash. It's, it's nice to hear people talking about it that way. Thank you, Doug. This has been such a pleasure. I've just enjoyed the conversation and, you know, exploring ideas that you don't always get to explore when you're talking about the you know latest NFT and <laughs> uh, whether it's going to raise the floor price or not. It's not as exciting as some of the other things, maybe. It's just, it's just digital cash at the end of the day, but we uh, we think it's important around here. Maybe yeah. maybe we'll see you at Monerotopia. We're throwing a we're throwing an event in Miami, April seventh. Are you going to be at Bitcoin conference? Um, actually, I'm not. I haven't planned out my conference schedule yet. Um, so yeah, oh. tell us more about like when Monero uh, conference is and uh, April seventh in Miami. It's the same time as the Bitcoin 2022 that that mega Bitcoin conference that's happening in Miami. Uh, it's going to be right down the block. Um, so yeah, I'll. Send you information on monerotopia.com. Would love to awesome. meet yeah, you. Yeah, please do. And if I'm if I'm there in person, yeah, I would love to get together. So cool. Where can people learn more about you, follow you, things like that? Uh, yes. Yeah, so if you want to follow me on Twitter, uh, Technology Poet is my uh, Twitter handle. You can also find me at technologypoet.com. We just started a crypto podcast called Just Crypto, um, where we talk to NFT artists, creators, builders, and ecosystem with the idea of bringing people a human face uh, to the, the folks in our community are pushing us forward. Um, and then professionally, I work at Permission. Permission is at permission.io. So if you want to check us out, see what we're all about, uh, we'd, we'd love to also answer questions on, on that if you hit me up on Twitter. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Doug. <laughs> see you later.
Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.